this third Sunday of Advent, we want everything to look nice. The decorations of the season, our homes with their lights and tinsel, wreaths and ribbons, we want to lighten the darkness around us, bring beauty to the ugliness that wears us down. We decorate because it is tradition, because it lifts our hearts, because it makes us feel like children again. We deck our halls because company is coming. The prophet Isaiah smiled when he said, God will give a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. No matter how far we feel from the spirit of the season, God promises to decorate us with love and with joy. We light these candles as a sign of our joy in the beautiful things of this season. Not just the things that glitter and flash, but the deeper things, the beauty of the heart and the soul, the beauty of love shared in service and hospitality. We light this candle of joy because company is coming. on me, 
Because God anointed me. He sent me to preach good news to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, announce freedom to all captives, pardon all prisoners. God sent me to announce the year of His grace, a celebration of God's destruction of our enemies, and to comfort all who mourn, to care for the, for the needs of all who mourn in Zion, give them bouquets of roses instead of ashes, messages of joy instead of news of doom, a praising heart instead of a languid, heavy spirit. Rename them oaks of righteousness, planted by God to display His glory. They'll build the old runs, raise a new city out of the wreckage. They'll start over on the ruined cities, take the rubble left behind, and make it new. You'll hire outsiders to herd your flocks and foreigners to work your fields. But you have the title priests of God, honored as ministers of our God, because you've got a double dose of trouble and more than your share of contempt. Your inheritance in the land will be doubled and your joy go on forever. Because I, God, love fair dealing and hate thievery and crime I'll pay your wages on time and in full and establish my eternal covenant with you. Your descendants will become well known all over. Your children in foreign countries will be recognized at once as the people I have blessed. I will sing for joy in God, explode in praise from deep in my soul. He dressed me up in a suit of salvation. He outfitted me in a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom who puts on a tuxedo and a bride a jeweled tiara. For as the earth bursts with spring wildflowers and as a garden cascades with blossoms, so the Master, God, brings righteousness into full bloom and puts praise on display before the nations. So today I want to break down this passage of scripture. And the first verse there talks about the Spirit of God, the Master, is on me because God anointed me. The Holy Spirit has always been active in helping us to know and to do the will of God. He is our guide. He is, is the uh, all-knowing God that shares with us what God the Father, God the Son want us to accomplish. He is ever-present and ever-able to guide us and to lead us in the paths that we should go. Without His abiding presence, we cannot live for Jesus. Without the Holy Spirit's presence, first of all, we, we haven't uh, received a call to accept Jesus, for the Spirit draws us and helps us to understand our need of salvation. He also draws us and teaches us and guides us what to say, when to say it, who to go talk to, who to uh, uh, back away from. He is our guide. He is our instructor. He, he uh, helps us so much. Now, without His presence, we are adrift without a purpose. We are, are just rambling around, doing whatever we think we ought to do at the time, with no sense of purpose, with no goal, with no ambition, but with the Holy Spirit guiding us in our lives, He puts us where we belong to accomplish God's purposes in this world. Then it goes on to say, He sent me to preach good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, 
or to heal the bro heartbroken, announce freedom from all captives, pardon all prisoners. He sends us on holy tasks to help in his mission to bring healing and liberty to our lost and dying world. He sends he wants each of us to, this ought to sound familiar, be prayerful and sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading. To secondly, listen to the concerns of others. To third, eat with others as God gives us opportunity. To serve others as we know what needs that people have we do something about them. And then fifth, to share about your experiences with God. Yes, that's the blessed program that you just studied. Now, God is using the COVID virus today to tenderize the hearts of the lost around us. We need to be sensitive to the Spirit's leadings so that God can use us to make a difference in our world. Remember, the difference between this outreach program and other programs similar is that we are going to remember to use it, to get out there and do something about it. So then, let's look at, at verse 2. God sent me to announce the year of His grace a celebration of God's destruction of our enemies, and to comfort all who mourn, to care for the needs of all who mourn in Zion, give them bouquets of roses instead of ashes, messages of joy instead of news of doom, a praising heart instead of a languid, heavy spirit. Rename them oaks of righteousness, planted by God to display His glory. In God's grace, He reveals to each of us our need of Him. You know, it's, it's it, as a little child, when you try to get them to let you help them, they say, no, I can do it myself. Well, we have church people, adults, that think they, they can do it themselves. And the quicker we learn that we need God, and the quicker we learn that we can do nothing without Him, the more effective we'll be. And so let's, let's remember that. We, we cannot serve Him our own way. We have to serve God His way. God will destroy the ones who do evil to us and comfort those who mourn. Those who do evil to us. That everyone I know of has had somebody hurt them a time or two. I mean, let's face it, people kind of enjoy hurting each other sometimes. And I'm grateful that someday God will take care of some of those situations. I don't wish anybody any harm, but want it be nice to know they can't do it to anybody else ever again too. God knows how to handle it and in his justice he says vengeance is mine saith the Lord, right? And uh, so it's important to realize if it's in God's word we have to talk about it. He will destroy the ones who do evil to us. But then he also comforts those who mourn. Instead of grief we will sense his comfort and love and we will praise Him. Instead of grief, we will sense His comfort and love. We will praise Him. God, help us all to, to just allow God to have His way and to shape our spirits and to cry with us, but also learn to rejoice uh, with Him. Let's go on down to verse 4. They'll rebuild the old ruins, raise a new city out of the wreckage. They'll start over on the ruined cities, take the rubble left behind, and make it new. 
I'll tell you what, I like that verse because it says, basically, God is an expert redeemer. He can go to the trash heaps of our lives and the messes that we've made, and he picks up the broken pieces and makes it useful again. I've often told churches that we are in the people building business, not the people tearing down business. And we need to remember that. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, including us. Aren't you glad we have a redeemer? Verse 5. You'll hire outsiders to herd your flocks and foreigners to work your fields. But you'll have the title priest of God, honored as ministers of God. At this point, I want to say every one of us should make our number one priority in life ministering as God directs. So many times we come to church on Sunday, we, we go to church on Wednesday nights maybe, and all, but then the rest of our life, the rest of our time, we spend doing what we want to do instead of being sensitive to what God might want us to do out there in our everyday world. I'm glad that we serve a God that wants us to be a part of His plan. Let's make God our number one priority. You know, if we make Anything else, our number one priority, it's idolatry. We have to keep God number one in our lives. Secondly, let's choose how we, how we use our time wisely. Let's redeem the time because the days are evil. I have a friend who was diagnosed this week with COVID. And uh, he's a very, very busy person. And so I reminded him, I said, well, while you're at home and you can't go out and you can't do anything, make sure you spend some time with God and that you pray, that you read your Bible, that you study, that you try to prepare yourself uh, for what God wants to do in your life. And then lastly, let's bless those who are poor in spirit. Those who are downtrodden, there's a lot of discouragement. There's a lot of depression. There's a lot of, uh, of just feeling bad going on right now. And we need to be an uplift and an encourager to those around us. Let's bless the people around us and not be a burden. And then it says, you'll feast on the bounty of nations. You that you'll bask in their glory. And that basically means God will take care of us. God will provide even from the resources of others. Verse 7. Because you got a double dose of trouble and more than your share of contempt, your inheritance in the land will be double and your joy go on forever. That reminded me of the song, It Will Be Worth It All When We See Jesus. You know, there are some people that it seems like that they get double the trouble of those around them. They get more than their share of contempt in this world. Aren't you glad that we serve a just God? Remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus? And how Lazarus was home in the bosom of Abraham. And the rich man who lived for himself. Now not all rich men are sinners. But this man was. And that from hell he cried out. Asking, asking that uh, Lazarus be allowed to come and dip his finger in water and cool his tongue. Because of the torment. I'm glad that we serve a just God. That's going to make up for the the situations that we've lived through. But let me tell you, those situations that you go through will help you be more sensitive to the needs and cares of those around you.
Verse 8. Because I, God, love fair dealing and hate thievery and crime, I will pay your wages on time and in full and establish my eternal covenant with you. We serve a righteous ruler. He is righteous in that he always keeps his word. He's promised that if we live for him, if our lives belong to him, if we accept him as our savior, he will take us to be with him. Verse 9, your descendants will become well known all over. Your children in foreign countries will be recognized at once as the people I have blessed. He will take care of your loved ones. I know one of the situations that I'm dealing with where there are there's a parent of adult children who found out that he doesn't have a whole lot of time to live. And he's, he's really burdened by it. He's a wonderful Christian man. But he has this burden for his kids. And it's just crushing him, knowing that some of his kids need Jesus. And he's hoping that he can make an influence on that. Well, I'm grateful today that we serve a God who remembers the prayers of grandparents and parents and may put people in their lives that will lead them to the Lord even after the parents and grandparents have passed on. Verse 10. I will sing for joy in God. Explode in praise from deep in my soul. He dressed me up in a suit of salvation. He outfitted me in a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom who puts on a tuxedo and a bride a jeweled tiara. Our salvation will be celebrated with joyful singing. What a celebration that's going to be. Can't you just hear the bands? Can't you hear the explosion of praise when we step into that heavenly kingdom? And then the last verse here, verse 11. For as the earth bursts with spring wildflower, <coughs> excuse me, and as a garden cascades with blossoms, so the master God brings righteousness into full bloom and puts praise on display before the nations. That reminds me, first of all, that God is the best artist ever. Have you ever been in some of the very beautiful spots that we have here in the, even the United States? We have places where flowers are just continuous. Or you see the mountains and you see the cascading greenery and all that, that comes down. You see the waterfalls and the different places. God really knows how to put on a celebration show. Can you imagine what that celebration is going to be like when we when we get home. He brings righteousness into full bloom. I like that. And puts praise on display before the nations. Now that's not just talking about heaven. That's talking about right now. God's people need to praise Him and worship Him. And so that reminds me of this thought. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. What a neat way to live, right? It's a joyful way to live. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her King. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the time that we've shared. We pray to God that you would guide us and direct us and help us, Lord, and challenge us during this time to draw ever closer to you, closer than we've ever been before, so that we can also be more useful 
in your kingdom. God, you direct us. Keep us safe. Bring us back to health and bring us back together soon to worship you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.